This is a fan-generated show. If you'd like to support us, please go to jamieglazov.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our new Rumble channel. All your support is greatly appreciated. Good evening. Welcome to the Glazov Gang Christmas Special. This evening, the birth of Jesus Christ. With us this evening is a biblical scholar who will share with us why God sent his only son. With us this evening, what a privilege and an honor to have Mike Fortuna, a biblical scholar, with us. Brother Mike, welcome to the program. Well, thank you for having me, Jamie. I appreciate being on on this great Christmas week. Thank you so much, and uh, it's an honor to have you here to discuss this uh, very sacred issue and sacred topic during this very sacred time. Uh, Mike, before we begin the discussion, what has been on your mind lately? Well, I just want to pray for everybody before we start, if that's okay with you. Okay. Lord Jesus, we just lift up this meeting. We lift up all the ears that are to hear and the eyes to see. And we thank you for that. There's an opportunity to preach not only the gospel, but that it'll reach the hearts of many men and women. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Praise Jesus. Brother Mike, what is Christmas? Well, Christmas uh, is the birth of Christ, means Christ mass, is really, if you want the true definition of it. And it's the birth of a Redeemer who has been talked about since, since Adam's fall, when God told Eve, your seed will bring forth the deliverer. Not Adam's seed, it's hers. So Adam, uh, so man had nothing to do with it. That's why it's called the virgin birth, because right? the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and Christ was formed in a room, in, a, in her womb. And if you know anything about Jesus, he is before all things and all things consist by him. So he came uh, as a sinless uh, person onto this world. That's why he was called the son of God and the son of man. So this, it's a very special time. Now, I know the birth of Christ didn't happen on the 24th of December, but it's, it's generally accepted that we celebrate his birth on the 24th of December. And I don't want to get in arguments with people that uh, it, it's just, it goes nowhere. This is an opportune for people to understand and comprehend who Jesus Christ really is, what he really has done, and what he has done for us as, a, as human beings. Thank you so much, Brother Mike. When God created the world, he knew everything that was going to happen and he knew that his son would be a savior from the very beginning, right? Correct, because he spoke the end of things in the beginning. Uh, if you look at the Torah, the first five words of the Torah are Elohim is Aletaf Barshi Elohim Bara. Those five words mean it's, that's the gospel. Uh, that's uh, the Jewish alphabet, meaning in, in Greek you would say uh, Alpha. And omega, but in the Hebrew, aleph is a uh, very important word, meaning when you really break down the word aleph, it it talks about the divinity of God, and then it's, so it's uh, ya, ve, uh, yud he, yud he or ya, ve, ya, and that is uh, the connection between the di divinity of God, man, and how Christ came, and so that is the beginning of all things. Uh, Taf is truth. That's why Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am uh, the light of the world. So when you go back to Genesis, uh, before everything was created, you say the light. There was light that came. Uh, th th there is, that's like another show, another episode. That's totally something uh, different. But Adam fell, and Christ came to redeem us from that fall. Um, I'm going to go to some scriptures in the Old Testament. Uh, go ahead. You have a question. Okay, Brother Mike, so because the, pardon? I know I'm going a little too deep right now, but. No, 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 it's, it's, it's perfect, it's perfect. Uh, Brother Mike, so the serpent deceived Eve, and, um, and then Eve got Adam to sin, and that, that's another, uh, it got, got Adam to eat the apple as well. And because of that, there was a fall and the flesh became corrupt. And because of that fall, all of humanity is damaged. It's a broken parking lot. And 
everyone is kind of condemned and their souls are going to hell because of what Adam did. And so God so loves the world and loves us so much that he sends his son to save us from what happened there. Is that an okay summation? Yeah, in the scripture, I'm going to read it. It says, therefore, the offense by one, judgment came upon all men. The offense by one. Well, who's the one? Adam. Adam is, so the, the offense by one man, Adam, Judgment, judgment came upon all of his descendants. That's just what happened. Adam, Jesus says, I am the second Adam. He says, the first Adam is a living soul. I am a second Adam. I am a quickening spirit. So he's now referring to Adam and how he fell. Let me go on. Uh, Therefore, as by the offense of one, uh, of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, the righteousness of one, the righteousness, that's Christ, the righteousness of one, the free gift, it's free. You don't pay for it. You don't earn it. It's a free gift. Came upon all men unto justification to life. So Christ, when he died for us, he took our sin. He took our penalty. He took the judgment of Adam, and he put it upon himself, the one who knew no sin, the one that did not sin. Uh, Jesus never had to make an apology to anybody. He always was at the right place at the right time doing the right thing all the time. And he answered people correctly. He answered the politicians correctly. He answered the Pharisees correctly. And he answered the Sadducees correctly. Even, uh, even the, uh, the, the rulers that he sat in judgment, they said, this man is innocent. And that's about the birth of Christ. So what he did, what he did was he uh, took our sin. He took our place. He took our judgment. Once you accepted Christ, no more judgment. It's over and done with. The fall of Adam is no longer on you. You are now, that's why Christ says, I come to give you life and I've come to give you life abundantly. So that is the nature and the works of Christ for us. He went to that cross, not because uh, uh, he went to that cross for our sake, not for his sake. He didn't have to, he didn't, he, he could have just came to the earth, here I am, end of story. But no, no, he went to Calvary for us because that's the ugliness of sin. So he took, a, he, he, took a, he, he took it for us. Praise Jesus. And it's just, uh, I don't know even if we can find words to describe the, the suffering that God's son endured for us to save us. And I have several questions my well, I have many questions. We'll see how many I can get out during our show. Let me ask this, uh, Brother Mike. So, the way that Jesus is born, Jesus always existed. So, the Holy Spirit put Jesus into the womb of Mary or... Um, let me see if I can discuss, uh, I want to make sure I dis um, describe this um, in polite terms, just in terms of, uh, so there's, a, there's Mary's egg, and then there's a male sperm. So in, instead of the male sperm, there was a Holy Spirit that kind of um, integrated with the egg, and then it created a human being, and then Jesus has Mary's DNA, or was Jesus just placed into the womb? Do you see what I'm asking? Right. What it, what it is, that's why I said the Holy, when it said the Holy Spirit came upon her, when it came upon her, he put uh, our, our Savior in her womb. Now, the methodology and how that occurred, I, I don't know. We do know that the placenta in and of itself uh, doesn't carry any blood whatsoever. That's why uh, there's no bloodline. There. It's Christ that's in here. All, all the placenta, all that the womb does and the placenta does is give it nutrients and food. That's what it does. So that's okay, why just, no, if, no, if there's a, no. If a DNA test was taken of Jesus and Mary, would they have been related? This I don't know. I don't, uh -huh. I don't know. It, it does talk about in the gospels uh, from Adam to Christ and also from uh, King David, 
to Christ. Right. That's why there's a there's a bloodline and there's a royal line. Okay, uh -huh. and so that's why uh, Joseph had to go to Bethlehem is because of his bloodline. I mean, his royalty line went there. He had to go there. He actually uh, is in lineage uh, for uh, off of David and off to be uh, uh, to be a, a ruler and a king. And if you look in the in the scripture, and I'm going to go back to uh, Malachi five two, it says, "But you, this is now. These are hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ is born." I'm going to go with Isaiah seven fourteen, which is seven hundred years before the birth of Christ. And the, uh, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and we will call him Emmanuel. See, so even 700 years prior to the birth of Christ, it's already foretold. Malachi 5.2 says, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, even though you are the small among the clan of Judah. Now, he's also from Judah, from the tribe of Judah. Out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins from old, from the ancient times. Now that is referring to when God said to, they were both called Adam, by the way. I'm, I'm so, she wasn't called Eve yet. They were both called Adam. So Jesus, Jesus coming as the Messiah and being born of Mary is predicted in the Old Testament. Correct. And I just gave you two, Isaiah 7, 14 and Malachi 5, 2. Uh, this is this is talking about a savior that's coming to save. Actually, he came to save Israel. If you real, it's all about Israel. Amen. So, but the scripture it, does talk about, and it's and it's hidden. The church is hidden. Uh, it's revealed in the New Testament, but it's hidden. Uh, so you really have a hard time trying to find the church in the Old Testament and the Gentiles. Uh -huh. But uh, Jesus, even Jesus, when the Gentiles come to try to make him king, he said no. This is not the time. This is not the place for me to be uh, your king at this time. He withdrew himself. You know, people always have motives for things when, when Jesus was walking on this earth. So go ahead. But, but Brother Mike, but overall, this is an incredible miracle in the sense that Mary was a virgin and the Holy Spirit was involved in Mary becoming pregnant and giving birth to Jesus, right? Correct. And her sister and her, uh, and her cousin, uh, Elizabeth, who is a very old lady at the time, she birthed John. Zechariah, her husband, was a priest in the temple, and uh, Michael, uh, the Gabriel, came to him and and, and had some conversations with them. Uh, and he and John the Baptist was born, and he is the, the greatest of all prophets, and he prophesied also of the coming of Christ. In fact, during the baptism, he says, you know, he said, "Your shoes, I, I I'm not even worthy to even tie your shoes." Christ says, no, you need to baptize me. Uh, so there's, there's an awful lot that goes on in the Gospels that, uh, that people should read it. The best book for people to read in the Gospels is the Gospel of John. And that's about the love of God towards us. Because John always talks about how God, the love of Christ, the love of Christ, the love of Christ. John always talks about that. And that's one of the best uh, scriptures to read. Next to the book of Psalms and uh, uh, Proverbs. I like those three books, Psalms, Proverbs, and uh, John. Amen. Brother Mike, when, um, when Jesus was born, um, the word got out that, that he was called the king of the Jews or would be the king of the Jews. And the king of Judea, King Herod, found out about this and was very upset and he ordered the killing of all children under the age of two um, under the vicinity of Bethlehem. Uh, and then there was a massacre, and this is described in Matthew 2.16. What exactly happened there? Why did that happen? Was that Satan operating through Herod, trying to stop the Savior from coming to the world? What, what happened there? Well, also look to Moses, or Musha. Uh, Moses was in the same situation when he was... Uh born remember what pharaoh did he killed all the children from two and under because he knew a deliverer was a deliver, deliverer was coming for the jews so there's a parallel here and one child was saved and that's uh, moses and he grew up in uh in pharaoh's uh, household uh, say, see satan knows he knew that a deliverer was coming 
because that's why when God told the serpent, her seed will bruise your head. This is what's going to happen. He will have dominion and control. He did not like that. Remember, Satan is very, a very, he was one of the most beautiful, he's the most beautiful angel that was ever created. Uh, he was also an anointed, he was the only anointed angel. But yet, he himself deceived himself. The reason why man has an escape plan is because man didn't deceive himself. Satan deceived Adam. And God had a redemption plan for Adam, not for Satan, because he deceived himself and he wanted to become like God and be God. And he's always doing that. He thought, and this is how corrupt he is. He thought by killing, and this is my opinion only, okay? He thought by killing Jesus, he would have the authority and the power over everything. If he can just kill him, not knowing what was going to happen that Jesus, Jesus is God. He is really part of the Trinity. He is God that he laid down his own life and he picked it up again. And he preached to those who were in Haiti or in paradise or in Abraham's bosom. And he led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men. So there, that's another teaching altogether. But I, I, I'm quite certain Satan thought by the killing of Jesus would end everything and he could take control. Uh, look at uh, when he was fasting for 40 days. What did Satan do? He came to him and said, uh, and this is now, let's go to the baptism of John. When John baptized, a voice came from heaven and said, this is my beloved son. Whom, um, how'd that go, Grace? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Yeah, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Remember, this is my beloved son. When Satan comes into the picture, he says, what did he say? I'm sorry. Uh, oh, if, 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 if he, he left the beloved out, he left that whole part, of, part out. He said, if you are the son of God, make these stones or do this or do that. There's one point where he took him up to a high pinnacle. And he said, if you would only bow down to me, if you only bow down to me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. Jesus never argued that point. He says, you know, only the Lord thy God, you will, you know, bend your knee to. So Satan is so deceived even today. Even he, does, he doesn't know the New Testament, by the way. He did not know the New Testament was being unfolded in front of him. And now he, know, he never knew the book of Revelations, for goodness sakes. It was only by a revelation of the Holy Spirit through John that he was able to do all these things and write the, the New Testament. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. So in the book of Revelations, Satan didn't even know what was happening until it was written. He goes, oh, I see what's going to happen. So he knows his time is short on this earth. He really does. He, he's doing everything he can to control men or control this globe to have his power. Right. It's, it's fascinating and such a mystery, of course, that, of course, in, in Satan's, in his context, he knows quite a bit of what is happening, but yet he doesn't know so much. Um, and also even with Mary and, and the disciples and all to some degree, they know a, quite a bit, but in terms of how the story is unfolding, they of course don't have access to the whole divine plan. Um, but it's very interesting when Satan said to Jesus during the temptations, I will give you all of these kingdoms. Jesus did not contest the claim because it's true in terms of the timeline that Satan does own the kingdoms, quote unquote, of this earth for a while. Satan's the ruler of this earth on some levels for a certain time period, right? Correct. That's why Jesus says, you may be, you may be in this world, but you're no longer of it. That makes us, that puts, see what happens is you may be in this world, but you're no longer, when you, when you come to accept my son, Jesus Christ, you're no longer in this world, but you, you're no longer, you, you may be in it, but you're no longer of it. And I have separated, he says, I have separated you out of it. Now, I'm, I'm going to bless you. You're salt of the earth. I want you here. And I want you to bless people that are, that's our job. We're salt of the earth. Now, after the rapture, or hapazo, that's another thing in Timothy, uh, Thessalonians, that's another subject for another day. He says, but while you're here, you are salt of the earth and you are putting things at bay. That's why uh, Christians, really, men and women of God who accepted Christ should be praying against the coronavirus. We should. That's our job. We should be praying against it 
for it to fail and to stop. Uh, that's why God gives us an assignment. Uh, I'll give you an example. You don't, you, you don't have to, uh, like tithing, you don't have to pay tithes in the church, but it's, it's an honor to. You know, it's, 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 you don't have to work in a church or, or to volunteer, but it's an honor to, mm -hmm. to, to do that. You don't, mm -hmm. you don't have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's just, it's an honor to be filled. See, God says, I don't, you don't have to do, you can, if you accept my son, you're done. We're cool. But uh, I want you to be a blessing. I want you to be a blesser. I want you to give so you can be, so you can receive. See, God is not stingy. When Adam was created in the garden, he said, there's a, there's something there that belongs to me. That's my tithe. That belongs to me. You need to honor me and to glorify my name in this, the tree of life and death. And life is just as bad as death, by the way. Okay. I'm going to give you an example. You can see a guy with a sign that says, give me money for food or whatever. Now, out of your own guilt, you can give that guy 10 bucks. You think you're given, doing something light, but what you really do is you put death in that person because now he takes that, that money and he buys drugs with it. So was, did good come from what you did? No. That's why it's called the a tree of good and evil. And we can get into that as a subject for another day. But it, the focus of this whole thing is about Jesus Christ being birthed in Bethlehem. And why Bethlehem? Why there? Why in the manger? Why were there shepherds in the field? You know, there, God just doesn't do things just, ah, I'm going to surprise you. Uh, this is just, you know, oh, God is a mysterious God. And he's not. He says, you know, it's, a, it's the honor of God to conceal the matter, but it's, a, it's the honor of kings to search it out. And that's what he wants us to do is search it out. So the question is, why was he born in Bethlehem? That, is, that should be a, one of the keys. And one of the keys is the sheep that were meant for slaughter were born there, were birthed there. And they would take uh, uh, the lamb, the ewe lamb, and they would wrap it in swaddling cloth. And they would put it in a, in a hewed out stone. That sheep was destined to die. Whereas Christ's birth, he's born in a manger. Actually, it's a tomb. And he's wrapped in swaddling cloth and put in that same hewed out stone where those sheep are. He was born. Mary, if you look at Mary, she's holding the world. She's holding the creator of the universe, if you really think about it. And she puts him there. Why? She doesn't know it, but he's born to die for us. That, and, that, and, that's, and that's just a whole another subject. Uh, and that's truly what Christmas is about. He was born as a deliverer as a savior, as a healer, as a restorer. And he's going to put man back so that now he can see in the Old Testament, you can never see God face to face, not happening. All you could ever see at most, Elijah would see maybe the backside of him. And that was, that was enough. But now we see Christ. And here's Christ is walking. And a woman who had an issue of blood comes and touches his, his, his tassel. And he turns around and faces her. You see how God, how God now he's, now we can see him face to face. Moses had a veil. But now we can see God face to face. Uh, and, and that's the trueness of Christ. We can, that's why he is the image of God. He is the, really the express image of God. And he is the word of God. And that's what's in the Bible. In the beginning was the word. And the word you know, was God. And the word became flesh. So it, it, it's, it's so important that people can grasp who he is. Uh, Christ went to his disciples. I know I'm rambling on here. Christ goes to his disciples and he says, who, who do men say that I am? He's really asking them the question, but who do men say that I am? And they say, oh, you're a good guy. Uh, oh, you're a rabbi. Oh, you're, a, you're this and you're that. And he goes, yeah, you, you, that's true. I am all those things. But uh, oh, you disciples, who, who do you say that I am? And only one gave an answer. And that was Peter. And he said, thou art the Christ. And, and Jesus made an important statement. He says, that's only revealed to you through the Holy Spirit. See, it's the Holy Spirit that reveals to us who Christ really is. And that's why Christmas is so important. It's a revelation of who Christ is. Some people say Christ never came in the flesh. He was only a spirit. I'm sorry. A uh, spirit didn't go to the cross. A spirit didn't bleed for us. He's a son of God and the son of man. So that's important for people to comprehend that and who he really is. Some, religion, some religions take the deity of Christ and put it aside that they're preaching another, they're preaching another Jesus. That's why Galatians, uh, why he's saying, you know, you're preaching another gospel. It's another gospel. It's another person. It's not, it's not the, it's not the, well, the real Jesus of the Bible, you know, please stand up. It's not who Jesus is. 
<laughs> See, Jesus knows who he is and he says who he is. They wanted to stone him for goodness sakes because he, he forgave a man for his sins and his only God can forgive a person for sin. He goes, you, 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 you're not catching who I am. You're really not comprehending who I, I really am. So that's why Christmas is important. His death is important. His burial is important. And his resurrection is important. Praise Jesus. Um, I'm sorry. I know. I just went, I just went all I just like, No, no. Please stop apologizing because uh, every sentence you speak is, uh, is very profound and sacred. And, uh, and we appreciate it. Brother Mike, so Jesus came to die for us so that our soul can go to heaven. So that means that there's a, you could say, a battle for souls. And, and uh, it's unfortunate we have to keep bringing up this uh, Satan character who we know is much weaker than Jesus Christ and Jesus has all the power but there's this existence of Satan. And, and the soul must be something very serious and special because there's a battle over it. So at the risk of oversimplifying in my own silly way, but so there is God and God breathes his breath into man. And so all of us have a soul which is kind of the breath of God. We have a part of God in us, even though, of course, we're not gods. He's God. We worship Him. But we have something called a soul, which is part of His creation. And Satan is trying to take every single soul and pull it down with him into hell. And Jesus, through His death and resurrection, is giving us a chance, if we believe in Him, that our soul can go to heaven instead of to hell. But there's definitely the soul, there's a battle over each human soul. Why does Satan want human souls so much? Uh, because we're the image of God and he's not. He hates it. See, when God made us, we, he made us in his image. We have a spirit, a soul, and a body. We're a triune being. God is a triune being. And when Satan saw us, when we were created, when Adam, in his original form, okay, so we don't know exactly what his original form looked like, but when he created the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, remember, the Spirit of God moved on the face of the earth. That's why there's an old earth, and that's another story some other day. There's, there's an old earth and the new earth. So when the Spirit of God moved on this earth, uh, then we started to see uh, things happening. When they came upon Adam and they breathed into dust, uh, it, it, he became a living soul. He did. He became a living soul. Uh, I'm going to give you a little analogy. Eve was not made out of dust. And people didn't get, never, uh, they missed that in the scripture. Eve came, he, he, first God put Adam asleep. And because he didn't want to show him what he was doing. But uh, he put Adam asleep. And from his, and from his sleep, he took uh, what they say is a rib, to, and he formed Eve. This is why you find women, and, and this is kind of a crazy thing. Men don't mind getting dirty. Men don't mind playing in the You see a boy jumping in the mud and all that kind of stuff. Men like dirt. Women are different. Women are different. They don't like, they, they clean your hands, clean your shoes. You notice how they're always saying, clean yourself, clean yourself, clean yourself. That's because they were never born of dust. And if you ever notice the love of a woman for a man, she always wants to be close to him. Uh, they want to be comforted. They want to be hugged. They want to come because they instinctively, they know this is where I came from. So, uh, and you really can't get past that. Satan's job is to turn the, na the natural use of a woman into something else and the natural use of a man into something else. To, like we see oh, what the transgenders are doing nowadays, is to turn them into something that they were not created to be. And that is the deception of Satan to do such a thing. Hey, the Antichrist will forsake the love of women. What does that tell you? What does that tell you? He forsakes the love of women. He's gay. People don't they need to understand that it's very accepted now. It's very accepted. If you come against it, you'll be labeled. And in some places you can be jailed uh, for, for that. We, Christ accepts everyone. By the way, Jesus doesn't care what your past is like, 
He doesn't care if you're gay or if you're this or if you're that or you're green or you're pink or you're orange. He says, I came to redeem you. End of story. And that's what he is. And Satan hates it. He hates it with a passion because we have a redeemer that can transform people into his marvelous light. Listen. Just a sec. Uh, Brother Mike, just so there's no misunderstanding, when you said Jesus doesn't care and then describe some of this stuff, you're not saying that those things are not sins or that it doesn't matter. You're saying Jesus doesn't care in the sense of whatever sins you committed and commit that if you accept him and ask forgiveness and believe in him, you will be forgiven. Yeah, and say, look, look who, who, did be, who did Jesus hang out with in, in the New Testament? In the, actually, the Gospels are Old Testament. People don't understand that. The what, book of Acts is the New Testament. That's when the New Testament starts. When the tester dies, see, Jesus was under the law. That means it's part of the Old Testament. When Christ raised from the grave, he was no longer under the law. Okay, he was, he's risen. So there's a change. So now we have a new, we have a new, the law is written in our hearts and in our minds, he writes it. We don't go by the Sapphira stone that he wrote on, the Ten Commandments anymore, the 632 laws that came after that was, at that time was our schoolmaster. But now we have Christ, our Redeemer, who has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And that's the other thing, he's redeemed from the curse, he redeemed us from the curse of the law. If it's not of faith, then it's sin. And it's of the law. Either you're going to have the law or you're going to have faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. Another but, subject for another day, just about the law and, and, the, and the New Testament. Thank you, Brother Mike. Amen. But so overall, Satan wants to take the souls of humans to hell with him. He gets a certain power from that. He wants to rob heaven and God of the, the souls and uh, I just, I find that just, you know, very frightening, very telling, very sobering, whatever words we can use. But Christ's sacrifice for us um, destroys Satan's plan and human, the humans, if they believe in Jesus, can go to heaven. And so, so Brother Mike, when Jesus died on the cross, I, I, I'm very glad I have the time to, to ask you this. I've wondered about these things all of my life so much. When Jesus died, he descended to the dead. Uh, there's some different interpretations of this, but he went to hell or to some realm of hell for three days. Where exactly did he go? in your belief system, and what was he doing down there? He, he went to Sheol, or it's also called the, the bosom of Abraham. There's a story in the Bible where uh, there is a Lazarus, not the Lazarus that he raised from the dead, another Lazarus who's, a, who's in Abraham's bosom. And there's a guy, there's a great gulp fixed. And there's another guy saying, send him to tell my brothers uh, about, you know, send them back to earth and, and and Abraham said, no, there's a great fall, fall. And he cannot. He's got the law and the, they got the law and the prophets. End of story. And Jesus was telling the story. So there is a separation between. Uh, I'm going to tell you, where, if you don't accept Jesus, I'm going to tell you exactly where you go. It's called outer darkness. It's called the separation of God. And you live there forever. Satan, by the way, will be thrown into a lake of fire in the end. That's different. There's outer darkness. And there's a lake of fire. One's called Tapara. And then you also, uh, so when Christ went, he went to where Abraham's bosom was at, which is called Sheol. And he led captivity captives. So he led Abraham out, uh, Isaac out, Jacob out, everyone that was there. He led, he led captivity captive. And they went to, to heaven with him. But wait, was, so it wasn't hell? No, it's a separate, there's a great golf fix. There is a place for people to go, which is a separation from Christ. They stay there forever and for eternity. But wait, you're saying Abraham and some good people were in this place? No, there's a, there's a, there's like, if you can see of a wall, there's a, if you think of a wall, Abraham's on one side and the people that have rejected the law and the prophets, they're on the other side back then. Even the people that, uh, that's why it's called soul sleep. That's why, uh, Paul would say, you, you're not, that's why when uh, they talked about Christ, it, it, the Pharisees, they don't believe, they believe one way. He said, listen, 
uh, Abra I'm the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of the living. I'm not the God of the dead people. See, Christians don't die. You, people don't need to understand that. You may fall asleep, but you don't die, meaning that you're in heaven. You have eternal life. What you think is death here is just your, is just your outer shell going back to dust. Too bad, so sad. But during the resurrection, it all comes back. Uh, all that comes back, and we will be like, and we, we see Christ will be like him. We'll have a glorified body. We'll have a body just like Jesus. When he says, when you see me, you'll be like me. You're going to have a glorified body. And we don't know what that body truly looks like, but it's going to be a lot longer, younger than what we look right now. Okay, but okay, so Brother Mike, but so Jesus went to this place after he. Yeah, and he, he rescued a whole bunch of souls and brought them to heaven. He preached the gospel to them. He preached to them. And he was so there he, for three days. So he went there and preached. Right, and they accepted him. They all accepted him there. And he led them. That's why I say he led captivity captive. And then, mm -hmm. as his name, he gave gifts unto us, gifts unto men. Those gifts were for us. Mm -hmm. And that's and another, then, that, that's, a, that's a whole intense thing. Uh, teaching right there. Thank you, Brother Mike. Well, exactly. We, we have such a short period. We touch on so many topics. We have many different, also, you know, uh, many different uh, viewers and different beliefs. And, you know, I, I, I have the, you know, Catholic believers on today. Um, you are, and what denomination are you, Mike, if I may ask? Well, non-denominational. Uh -huh. I, I, when I grew up, uh, I grew up under the Assemblies of God, and I also grew up under the Foursquare organization. So uh, like I have seven of my uncles that are uh, Assembly of God pastors. Uh, my father was a pastor under, the, uh, under a non-denominational. And if I told you how that church started, it, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it. If I told you, you would not believe it. We will, we will discuss that on another program. Brother Mike, so then Jesus descent, well, I'll just say in our Catholic faith, it says Jesus descended to the dead. Um, but whatever the interpretation is, then as you said, he preached, he, he, uh, he released and brought people to heaven with him. Then he came back and visited his apostles and visited everyone. And uh, there's a very moving, for me it's so moving when, um, when Doubting Thomas saw him and, and Jesus said to Doubting Thomas, Doubting Thomas looked at his hands and at, at, the, at the holes, I think, in Jesus' hands from the crucifixion. And Jesus said to him, um, blessed are you who see it. He said, blessed are you who see and believe, but especially blessed are those, and maybe I got this a little wrong, but you, you see and believe, but blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. I think those are just extremely sacred, important words from Jesus, right? To all of us. Well, all, all the disciples uh, doubted it, uh, not just Thomas. Remember, when the women went to the tomb and an angel, an angel spoke to them, whom do you seek? You know, uh, they ran back and told the disciples, hey, Christ is gone. He's not there. They didn't, they didn't get it. They didn't understand it. They, they, listen, they were afraid in the upper room. If you look in the book of Acts, they were in fear. Uh, it, and, and when they went to the tomb, they didn't see him there. They didn't. Because uh, Peter, being the eldest of them all, he was allowed to go first. And he saw two angels on the side. And he saw uh, his face napkin. And there's a Jewish tradition for that. His face napkin was folded. Uh, when you go to a Jewish household and you fold your napkin, you leave, that means you're coming back. That's what Christ says, I'm coming back. If you crumple up and throw it, that means I'm not coming back. I'm done. I'm gone. So uh, he folded his face napkin for a reason. I'm coming back. That's again, uh, that's just a, Jew, a Jewish tradition. And Jesus was Jewish, by the way. Uh, so it was, and when, uh, two, when uh, two disciples were walking back and they, uh, they looked like sad and there was someone behind them talking to them. He goes, Hey, why are you so sad? They go, Hey, haven't you heard what happened uh, about Jesus and this and that. And then the guy behind them started revealing to them the law the prophets, uh, and, uh, and he started revealing himself to them. And then they, they later said, we know, didn't our hearts burn when the guy was speaking? Wasn't our hearts burning? But then Jesus revealed himself to his disciples in the upper room, and they believed. See, he would rather have you believe through his word than seeing him in a vision. 
He'd rather have his word revealed. That's why it's called a revelation or rhema. He wants his word to be a, a revelation to you. Uh, look, Jamie, we have a, a, a youth in our country that are committing suicide at an alarming rate in every state. It's because Christ isn't being preached. What they're doing, a lot of churches are preaching the law. You must, you must do this. You must do that. You must do this. If you don't do this, if you don't pray hard enough, you don't do this uh, long enough, this is wrong. They got to preach the salvation of Christ. Uh, Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther during the Reformation talked about the grace of, grace of Christ to the Catholic Church. By the way, they wanted to kill him for that, but it's the grace of God. And what he has done, his finished work on the cross means the finished work. And that is truly, I know we talk about that in another season during the year, but I bring it up during Christmas because he went to that cross. Listen, there, when they took him, when, when he went for judgment, the Romans took him and they beat him. They didn't do it under Jewish law, meaning uh, 30, 40, 39 times, say one with the leather strap. Those, those, those Romans uh, circled him. It was a garrison that surrounded him, a garrison. Now, if you look at a garrison of Romans, they were not all from Rome. They were from the known world. And some of them were there to do their 25 years to become a citizen. Uh, most of them were there for that. But those countries that were occupied, people became Roman soldiers. That garrison wasn't just all Romans. It was the whole world around him looking at him. And then they came out with the long whip and they beat him and they beat him so bad. When you read the book of Isaiah, you could not even look at him. That's how, that's how bad it was. You could see his bones. You could see everything was exposed. And yet that beating he took for us. And now he's carrying a part of the cross to Calvary, which is called Golgotha. In my uh, understanding, that's where the uh, skull of Goliath is put. He carried it and he fell. Remember the part where he, he fell? He fell so we could stand. His, his, he fell so we could stand. We're always a fallen creature, but yet Christ fell and we can now stand because he's done it for us. Even the generational curse with sour wine and, and they, put it, they put it in his mouth. This is one of the last things he did. He took generation curses away from everybody he see, I don't believe uh, signs of miracles and wonders is great for the world, but that a Christian lives in divine health because of what he did on the cross and what that garrison did to him. They beat him so bad they looked you couldn't look at him. You could not look at him with a straight face without seeing and, something so terrible. And and brother Mike, and G and God loves us so much, and Jesus loves us so much that he suffered that much for every single one of us who accept him and believe in him and what he did, that our soul can go to heaven. And, and, and if we believe in Jesus with our hearts earnestly and really believe in his existence and what he did and we worship him, we will go to heaven. Correct. See, there was a divine exchange. We're destined for judgment. So Christ came and he switched. He took the judgment and now we're righteous. We have become righteous. Once you've become righteous, that's what God has called us. You can't unrighteous. You cannot make yourself unrighteous. What God has called righteous and what God has called blessed, that's that. It's settled. When he looks at us, do you think he looks at us or does he see the blood of Christ on us? He looks at us through the blood of Jesus. And he goes, that's a righteous person. And it doesn't matter what Satan says. That's a righteous person. End of story. He's accepted my son. He's covered with his blood. He is redeemed. He is restored. And by the way, we sit together with him. We have, that's what, he's, that's what Christ said. We have risen with him. We sit together with him in heavenly places. Christ is sitting. He's not running around. He's sitting at rest. He's now at rest. Amen, Brother Mike. Our time is up. Thank you so much for joining us for this Christmas special. Thank you for sharing with us um, the story of Jesus' birth and, and sharing with us the message of Jesus Christ and everything that he did for us in terms of his sacrifice. And praise be to Jesus for his, his resurrection and the salvation he offers us. 
before we leave, um, could, could we finish with a prayer from you? Yeah, I'm going to speak, not a prayer, but a blessing over those who watch and those who hear. Father, I thank you for the Deuteronomy 28 blessing that's upon every ear to hear and every eye to see. I thank you that you will put everyone at the right time at the right place. Father, those, I, I also believe that the blessing of God will transcend to such a point that the coronavirus has nothing to do with any believer or anyone that hears this message. I bless their goings out and I bless their goings in in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And bless Amen. Jamie and his staff and his show. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brother Mike. What an honor. And uh, it is very, very special to have you here. Thank you for uh, sharing the Christmas message and the message of Jesus Christ with us today. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Mike. Thank you for joining us for our Christmas special this evening. Merry Christmas. Jesus Christ is born. And we'll see you soon. Good night.